Hi everyone and welcome to The Storytellers, a family book event for Crinoon and Oak, brought to you by DLR Libraries and Wonderfest, the online children's book festival which will be on again this year in November. Today we have three amazing storytellers for you. We have Shane Hegarty, Marita Conlon McKenna and Paul Howard. They'll be talking about what inspires them, where they get their ideas from and so much more. Shane and Marisa are here in the lovely DLR uh, library, Lexicon Library in Dunleary. We're in the studio. Um, and then Shane will be joining Paul at his home in Wicklow. If you're a reader or a writer or both, I know you're really going to enjoy this event. The chat box is open during our event, so please do put in uh, where you're watching from and maybe even your favourite book and we'd be delighted to answer any questions you have on books or reading or writing as well. And now to Shane, Marita and Paul. Shane is the best-selling author of the Dartmouth and the Boot series. He is also an experienced journalist and writes a column for the Sunday Times. He's been working hard over the year, delivering terrific online events for schools and festivals all over Ireland and beyond. Marita Con McKenna is one of Ireland's best loved storytellers. Her famine story, Under the Hawthorn Tree, is a modern Irish classic and as well as winning many awards, has been adapted for both stage and screen. She also writes best-selling novels for adults and her latest, The Hungry Road, was also set during the famine. But is she writing another children's book? Let's find out. Paul Howard is an author, journalist and comedy writer, best known for his Ross O'Carroll Kelly books, which have sold over one million copies. Aldrin Adams and the Cheese Nightmares is his debut children's book, solo children's book, and is a cracking read. So first up, I give you Shane Hegarty and Marisa Conlon McKenna. How are you doing, Marisa? I'm doing great, actually. I, I'm actually doing great. I've enjoyed the lockdown as much as I can enjoy it. I, you see, when you're writing, as you know, Shane, you're at home and you're working on your own. Yeah. So I've a lovely big study and I'm working at home on my own and watching the squirrels and the foxes in the garden and the dogs <laughs> sitting at my feet. So my routine hasn't changed that much. Um, I do miss, you know, miss me, um, visiting schools and seeing children. And of course, I really miss seeing my own children, my grandchildren. That's been the hard part because they come and they wave at me in the driveway. Oh, yeah. But um, but in terms of writing, for writers, I don't think it has been that bad. Now, I know some writers got blocks and they couldn't write at all. Mm. But um, I found it a creative time, to be honest, because, um, you know, I had finished a new book and it had come out just before the, lock the original lockdown. And then the stage play of Under the Hawthorn Tree, which just literally closed a few days before COVID broke out, was very lucky. And then I've managed to work away and, and write and I've written a, a children's book. I've written a big chapter for uh, another kind of academic book that's coming out. Um, I wrote a short story. I, I actually found it was quite creative. I don't know, did you find a creative time? Yeah, I found the first one creative because yeah. I think, I don't think, uh, when people think of children's writers, they, uh, uh, or writers generally, maybe they think that writers just sit down and write all yeah. day. Yeah. But of course, it's always a bit busier than that. And yeah. you're doing events and yeah. you're doing, um, uh, you know, you're, you, you have to run a little business yeah, yeah. Uh, to keep everything going. And so I was very busy. I was very lucky uh, because I was um, had the Citywide Read, which is, you know, the yeah, Dublin yeah. City Libraries and uh, had had made boot the Citywide Read. So I would uh, loads and loads of events. Yeah, yeah. And then I was in England for a week talking yeah. to schools and then I came home and everything bang, bang went quiet. And actually I was quite I wouldn't say I was happy that there was an international pandemic raging, I know, actually, but it was like nice for everything just to settle down I for had a while. Been, I so had I been, found that quite I nice. I had been all over the place because Hungry Road had come out, my big adult novel, and there was a, a launch in Dublin, a launch down in West Cork. There was loads of publicity around it. And then um, Under the Hawthorn Tree was turned into a stage play and it was on in the Mac in Belfast. And then it was in Cork in the Opera House and Wexford Opera House. And I remember it shut in Armagh, the big theatre there. I, I was literally running and running and racing and running. And um, next thing, actually, was when I was up in, on the train to Belfast that the first COVID person was announced because um, they were actually on the Enterprise. Oh, and right. I was on the Enterprise. My children phoned me and said, Mom, I hope you're not sitting beside someone. I said, I don't know who I'm sitting beside. But um, and then everything went quiet. But actually, you know, I think writers actually quite like quiet time. But I did miss family and friends and my grandchildren because they're usually in and out of the house. And But I probably got more writing done because they weren't in and out of the house and I wasn't babysitting and I wasn't, but I missed them terribly. 
and I have little twin um, grandsons, and I thought they oh. won't know who I am. They think who's this weird lady who yeah. keeps waving <laughs> in the car to us because they were only babies. But uh, no, I think for writers, if some writers found it very difficult, but I think if you're creative and you have time to do things, mm. and that's what's great because so many kids were writing and reading and painting and making stuff and doing stuff. So I think um, to get around to doing that is brilliant if you can use the time. Yeah, and funny, I think I found it fascinating. So we have four kids at home and three of them are primary school age. Oh, and we're doing the homeschooling. Yeah, so we have that. And I was lucky because my wife is fantastic and she, she took on the bulk of it yeah. um, and allowed me to write. And I had a chance to write a new book and all of that. But what was fascinating was I realised that actually in the first bit of it, especially before everybody figured out the homeschooling yeah. thing, a lot of what kids did and a lot of what the parents did and a lot of what the teachers did was to do creative things yeah. with them yeah. and I thought I sort of found it fascinating that actually when the structure of everything fell apart a bit and everything everybody yeah. had to go home a lot of the stuff that people went straight to were write a story yeah. draw a picture yeah. find things and kind of make things, you know yeah. stuff from whatever you find around and um, I think maybe it, you know, it, 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 it sort of said to me that sometimes we go straight for those creative things yeah. at those times when we need the most. And um, yeah, so it's kind of fascinating. Yeah, I think, I think in a way it, it did show, because I know my own grandchildren as well, that sometimes the school day is so busy, there isn't yeah. enough time for that. Yeah. They've got so much homework and things like that. And so I think the, the actual time to have that and the weekends to be able to do that. And even reading, because my eldest little granddaughter, we have our house is like coming down with books that's gonna fall <laughs> apart someday with all the books, tons of books. I'm, try, I'm trying to actually call some of them, but they, the grandchildren would come down and pick books yeah. and, and bring them up because they're all ones that are there since I was small and since my children, my own children were small, their parents. And it was lovely to see the grandchildren coming down and picking some books and going through all the books and picking out what they wanted. They're all ancient old books, but some yeah. of them are classics now. But it was just lovely to see them using, you know, the, the books we have in the house and saying, I need another book, Granny. And I'd, and I'd pick out a few that I thought they might like. Yeah. And because they weren't meant to be in the house and give them to them, you know, and drop them up to them. But it was just great to see. And I found actually, I went back reading all old stuff as mm. well because um, I bought some new books ordered online but I found I had all these books 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 shelves of books and um, I said you know something I'm going to go back and read a lot of them again yeah and I found I, ma I made up a space in the afternoon that I would um, because you know if you're writing in the day you have to take a break and it wasn't like I was doing normal things going out and about so barbering the dog for a walk I wasn't really going anywhere so it was lovely to take a break then and pick up an old book and uh, one that I loved, or that I had got, and actually hadn't even read properly before for some reason. And I, I just made a time every day to do that. I got right. through loads of books yeah. that, I, that had been sitting in my house and I hadn't read or reread for donkey's years. And I, and so I tried to do children's books and adult books. So I'd, yeah. I'd go between a lot of them and just rereading them, which is really lovely because they're special books to me. That's yeah. why I kept them. Yeah. And then some of the words weren't special. I said, why am I keeping that book? I actually didn't really like it that much. You know? so I don't know if you got, but you probably didn't because you were young children, so you couldn't do that, you know, well, the my, luxury of it. But I, I love the way that they discover, you know, I've old, I, the Narnia books got discovered oh, yeah, during yeah. lockdown because yeah. um, they, they just, they were like that, they were kind of hungry for, yeah. they did a huge amount of reading and yeah. they found themselves just looking for anything. Yeah. And they would just rummage through my shelves and yeah. they would find things. Yeah. And, they did have that time, and as you said, maybe for a little while it took the pressure off. Yeah. But it's left them. My kids are reading just enormous amounts. Yeah, I think the they're moment. all reading a lot more. I think I'm yeah. sure everybody listening today that they're probably reading. And my little granddaughter, I had an ancient copy of Adrian Mole. It was probably oh, one of yeah. the first edition. It was all falling apart because I remember when I was well, I loved that book, Adrian Mole. And my granddaughter got that, and she absolutely loved it as well. Like, so uh, even though my daughters had read it as well, and my son, but you know, it was great to see. You know, books that have stood the test of time. Yeah. You know, that they have, that, you know, another generation can read them and still love them and yeah. haven't dated it at all, to be honest. You know? And so tell me, when you were, like, when you were young, when was the moment you realised you were a writer? Um, probably when I knew I wanted, I, I didn't know I was a writer, but I knew I wanted to be a writer. There's a difference. <laughs> I, I, I was obsessed to read. Once I learned to read, and um, I didn't grow up in a house, our house had hardly any books. Yeah. Mum and dad were not into books at all. My dad never read a book in his life, to be honest. Mm. Uh, even under the Hawthorne tree, it sounds terrible to say, when I gave it to him, he never read it. It was very sad. Yeah. He just did, wasn't a reader. But um, so the house wasn't full of books at all. But really, I remember when I started reading, 
and I started reading newspapers and magazines that my dad had and racing pages, believe it or not, and things like the racing page, the racing journal, things like that I'd read. And uh, we used to get um, what you call different magazines into the house and, and I used to read all of them and the newspapers. And then um, I remember we joined the library uh, in Greystones because we had a house in Greystones overlooking the sea. And I remember when I got my ticket for the library and a few tickets for the library, that was a big change for me. And um, because it was the first time I had access to proper books. Yeah. I didn't have any. I only had school books and um, the newspapers and magazines. And uh, I remember when I started going to the library, I just was obsessed. I'd go to the library every single day. I'd cycle up on my bike and, I, and, I, and some of my family wouldn't use their tickets. So I'd get everybody's ticket and I'd get all the, and I'd get so many books. The one time I actually crashed my bike, I had so many books on the back of my bike. I crashed my, my bike. I had one of those fold up bikes. And my father was actually driving through Greystones in his car. And um, I tried to wave to him, but I had so many books. And when I waved, my books went one way and I went the other way. I actually crashed into my own father's car. <laughs> <laughs> and then my father, I broke my arm. Oh my God. Oh yeah, I had to go to Hockenstown Hospital. We don't want to give the impression books are dangerous no, no, now. It was just, a, they the shifted, because it was a back carrier. <laughs> and there were so many books, they shifted. And my father was there and I said, God, I know somebody in that car. And then I could see my dad kind of waving at me. And I said, oh, I better wave back. It must have been somebody I know. Yeah. Because I, I, I'm not good on cars still. I don't, <laughs> don't know numbers on cars. And um, then I said, oh my God, it's my dad. And when I said, my dad, and then poof, into the car. Uh, and my dad got such a fight. And I was lying on the main street in Greystones with all my books and the bike in my dad's car. I'm sure people think that horrific man's after knocking his child <laughs> down in Greystones on the main street. But uh, anyway, so, uh, and then I kept saying, my, my arm was so sore, Dad. I could see like bones sticking out. I said, it was really bad, Dad. And he said, oh, you're all right, you're all right. Now put yourself together, you're grand. And I went home and crying all night. And you're grand, you'll be fine. And the next day then, we had a neighbor who was a doctor and he actually must've heard me crying during the night. And uh, he looked at me in the morning, he said, I think she needs to go to hospital. I think she's <laughs> broken her arm. So there was no cycling bike sent for six or eight weeks. And I was in a big cast, so I could do nothing. But uh, books were just so much a part of my life. And we started to read, and then once I got pocket money, because um, I started getting a little bit of pocket money then, and there was a little shop in Grayson's called Paddy's that sold um, like cigars and tobacco for people going on the train. And then, but it also sold paperback books. And had, yeah. you know, the Armada paperback books yeah. had a, a, a thing you could turn around and oh, I started reading every Armada paperback book on the planet. I bought them. And, and if it was my birthday, I said, just want books. Don't give me anything, only books. And I just read and read. And so I really thought if I could do that, it would be great. But I didn't think I could do it. But then actually, when I was in Grace, there was this man and he was a journalist. His name was Ash, J. Ashton Freeman. And he used to call him in the newspapers. And every day, or every week, he'd have column in and he'd write about things and he'd have sketches as well. And he was a wildlife expert. And even like Chivers Jam bought out a series of his wildlife cards. Mm. He's a terribly nice man and long grey hair and a beard. And he lived only about two or three doors up from us. And uh, he was always chatting to me. And I, I said, what do you do? You know, and he'd say, I write. And I'm, I'm a writer, you know, I'm a journalist and I write. And he's write wildlife books as well. And uh, I remember said, and all he did every day was sit on the wall in a big jumper or a big old, old shirt, look as happy as Larry. And, uh, and go off, he'd be up the beach or he'd be out in the boat. And God, I said, this is, this is a really nice, you know, and oh, poor dad going off into town to work and all the other dads yeah, on the train. Yeah. <laughs> and I just thought this is kind of a thing that might be nice, but I never associated I could do it. But I remember he actually did a little drawing of me and he had put in the newspapers, because I used to have plaits, my hair was really long and I had plaits. And he would keep saying, I'm going to take one of your plaits, I'm going to cut it with my, with my the knife he'd use for gutting the fish. And he said, I'm going to cut off your plait. And I'd say, no. No, no, I want my plat. And uh, but he was kind of the first person I met who was writing, yeah. you know. And uh, and I felt that's the thing. And then the more I read, by the same as you, the more I read, the more I realised I would love to do this. And I, and I'd say some books were very good, and I said, God, I wish I could write that book. And then some books were atrocious, and I said, mm. God, how did anyone like yeah. that a book? <laughs> you know. And I think then the bad. It's funny the bad books and the good books both help you to become a writer. I'm sure yeah. you felt the same yourself when you were young, did you? Yeah, I began, I suppose, um, I mean, I'm, for me, the moment where I realised that writing was a job was when I saw Roald Dahl on the TV. Oh, yeah. And until then, and I, and, and I think now, you know, any kids watching this now, they probably see quite a lot of writers, and they maybe yeah, writers go into schools. See, we no, didn't. We did it just wasn't... It wasn't like, done. It wasn't, I think the first person I ever saw who was a writer 
he was more than that was Eamon de Butler. Yeah. I went to see him. He came to the community centre in oh, Skerries. Yeah. Yeah. And that was the first time I ever went to anything that resembled a book a reading book or something like that. And Eamon de Butler, for a lot of the kids who yeah. wouldn't know, was this famous sort of wildlife like, writer. Yeah, and, a wildlife person uh, as well. Uh, yeah. He was amazing. And um, they, uh, and, but Roald Dahl, seeing Roald Dahl on the TV was the first time I realised that, uh, that the name on the book was a person, a yeah. real life person. And it was the first time I had that idea. But like that, I think um, you, as a writer, you find yourself and, uh, reading things, but sometimes in a different way, you read them to find out how they work. Yeah, how they do it. Yeah, and it's almost like the engine of a car. And yeah. I always say, because when kids say, I'd love to write stories, yeah. or I want to write, or how do you become a writer? And maybe especially older, yeah. either older uh, young adults or adults yeah. themselves, the first thing is the reading. Yeah. That's really, you know, before you can write, you have to, actually you read. Have to, be, you have to read that's, and read that's and read. That's what I'm always telling children. You know, if you wanted to play football, kick the football. If you want to play tennis, if you want to swim, if you want to do hockey. And I said, if you want to write, you have to read, 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 yeah. read, and then write, write, write. But I do remember, um, like, I, I kind of knew I wanted to write. And I didn't know how I could do it. And, like, I'm an older generation than you, but I remember all the writers in Ireland, all you ever saw was, like, Yeats and um, Beckett. And, and Joyce, you know, and yeah. all these like, portraits of them and things about them. And there wasn't any woman or any girl, like, you know. Yeah. But I remember I was reading Enid Blyton and I was reading Rosemary Sutcliffe and all the writers I read, I wrote to them all. Wow. But not, none of them wrote back to oh. me, unfortunately. <laughs> but I wrote, that's why I write back to everybody. If you write to me, I'll write back to you. But um, they didn't have them wrote back to me. So it's kind of disappointing. I always thought it was because we were in Ireland and somehow they couldn't get a stamp to go to Ireland. I always forgave them everything. Yeah. And I said, <laughs> because we were ERA. And I said, now, obviously, if you're in England, you can't buy a stamp to go to ERA. So the only reason that Amy Blyton hasn't written back That's to me or Rosemary Sutcliffe <laughs> is because I'm in ERA, you know? So and I, I was going on with this anyway, so um, I didn't really understand how it all worked. But then actually the first real, real writer I met was Seamus Heaney. Oh, wow. Yeah, and he came to my school. And I was about 13. 13, 14, and I remember um, it was in secondary school and uh, he came into the big hall and every week or every few weeks the nuns would have a person would come to talk to us. Now usually it was a person back from the mission or Korea or somewhere like that or Bangladesh or from um, Biafra or somewhere like that right. and it's some horrific stories of what, what they'd experienced and we'd be nearly crying with all the things that would happen, we trying to raise money for the, the children out there. And I remember one day we went in and the nun said, and today now we have somebody very different. We have a poet. And there was a big sigh of misery from the whole class <laughs> because a poet, what the hell do we want a poet and to, talk, to come and talk to us, you know? We didn't think there'd be any excitement of, of out in Africa or Korea, you know, and all that, you know? So, uh, and then I remember Seamus Heaney got up and stood up to this crowd of girls, the girls' school. And um, it was actually one of his first times, you know, doing yeah. anything like that. Um, his, his aunt was, I think, a nun, a Mount Anvil, a relation or something was a nun. And uh, anyway, so uh, he started talking and um, he was obviously a bit nervous. But I remember looking at him, I started reading his poems and, you know, about digging and, mm. you know, helping his mother peel the potatoes. I remember looking at him and I remember he had big hands and he had kind of long hair in those days. And he was kind of big and sturdy man and very nice and friendly and warm. And I remember looking at him and he, I realised he's a real person and he writes. Yeah. Yeah. And there's no like no big deal about it. It's just what he does, and that really gave me the first time I felt this connect that I, you know, real people can write. It's not somebody away off in Hollywood or over in London, or it's somebody in Ireland can do yeah. it. And it's funny because I was I was very fortunate. Years later, I got to know Seamus Heaney quite well. I met him a good few times, and uh, he was always so nice to me and so kind to me. And um, but I remember I told him about. It's amazing how one writer influences another writer. Yeah. But I remember telling him about being in school and um, the influence, and he was so good. He actually got a big piece of paper and he wrote a thing for my school. And uh, if they have it up in the library now framed. Wow. Yeah, I got it for them. So, because uh, I said, you know, it, that really changed. That was like a, I remember I felt like an electric shock had gone through me yeah. when I heard him talking and reading his poems. And his poems were very, like they were set in, it was quite clear they were set in Ireland. They were you know, from where he lived, you know, um, from Osborne. And it was just incredible to hear him read his poetry and talk about his childhood and his life going up on the farm yeah. and that, you know, so it was incredible. So that was a big influence to me, you know. But you know now, I mean, as we're lucky that we get to go into schools and talk yeah. to uh, young readers and we go to festivals. And yeah. obviously we're 
at the moment it's yeah. not uh, exactly that, what we would like. But online, and, yeah. You know, we've done great events. We're in this lovely library yeah, here today yeah. and I've you know, been lucky enough to do great events here. And, yeah, same but here, yeah. when you're in, they're the best audience, aren't they? Because you talk about the impact it made on you yeah. to have someone like Seamus Heaney there. Yeah. The kids are so open and they're so they're so creative and yeah. they're so imaginative and they're so keen to share all of that that it, it's it's a special age, isn't it, to write for? Yeah, it's a special uh, oh, age. I, I to be think it's a to. great age to write for, and also I think um, if you can encourage, because I I'm always conscious. I go into a classroom and there's say 24 kids there. Four of those will probably end up being writers. Yeah. Now they may not end up writing books. They might be writing film, TV scripts journalism, uh, writing computer magazines, uh, but, but they don't realise writing is involved in so much. It's not yeah. just books or poetry, but like everything you watch on television, everything they listen to on the radio, everything they see in a magazine, every, every computer game they play, the writers are behind that and they've got to realise that it's not just all books because they say, oh, I don't like books, I don't want to write a book, but you know, people, do you want to write a computer game? Because yeah. someone has to write them. Yeah. Someone has to write the music for the computer game. So it's amazing how, um, when you actually make them realise that, you know, how much bigger the world of writing is, especially nowadays compared to when we were younger. Yeah. It's got bigger and bigger and bigger. And um, so it's very important, but I'm really conscious when I go into school, that you want to touch everybody and encourage the ones, because some of them are such books, and some of them are going, I just want to write a book. And some of them have written books and they show them to you. I'm sure they're the same. They yeah. show you their oh, books. it's incredible. And it's wonderful yeah. to see, because I would have given my eye teeth when I was that age, because I had copy books full of stories and pages full of stories. And I would love to have gone up and showed them to somebody. Yeah. And, and somebody said, oh, keep going, or best of luck with your writing. I would have loved that to happen to me, but it didn't happen to me, because this writers didn't, and now, and in fact, we don't really realise, but in a lot of countries, they, writers don't go into schools and they mm. don't go. And there isn't events for children with writers and yeah. there isn't the same creativity in different countries. We just assume because we have it here in Ireland, mm. but not everybody has it. So, you know, when, I, when I'm abroad some places and I tell, oh, we do the writers in school and we have writer in children's book festivals, they're really um, amazed because they don't actually have them. Yeah. And the children haven't got that experience. And some schools are very just focused on the curriculum and doing the curriculum. And the curriculum is quite narrow and that's it. So we're very, very lucky to live in a world where creativity is valued. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, 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 uh, and, and, and watched over and guarded and, and funding is put into it too. You know? Yeah, no, that's a good point. And, um, it's funny when you talk to groups sometimes, say, as you said, there's so many different ways to tell a story that you might, you know, might say, who likes telling stories? And not all the hands will go up, but then you'll say, well, what did you talk about? So it's Monday morning. <laughs> I bet you all came in this morning and you it, talked about what, you, you know, what happened over the weekend, weekend yeah. and, and what's happening at home. And, yeah. and you realise that um, they all have that ability to tell a story at that yeah. age. And it's just that matter and, uh, of, of unlocking it really and finding, yeah. I suppose, sort of finding their voice sometimes. Yeah, and the, the confidence, to get their confidence yeah. to do it and that everybody has a chance to do it. And I think that's the great thing about the schools. Obviously, when you do a really big event and there's loads of schools, it's a bit harder. But you always try and give the time to everybody. And, you know, some people will ask questions, but really when they ask a question, they're asking a question for 20, 40 people might have the same question. Yeah. So they're asking for it. And then as you know, at the end then, if you're doing book signing or they're getting bits of paper signed or whatever, they come up. That's always a time that somebody will come up to you and say, I'm writing a book. Yeah. <laughs> I have a book and I, and I say, what's it about and what's it called? And I'm always interested and I always say to them, when your book comes out and you're really famous, yeah. will you invite me to your book launch? <laughs> <laughs> if I think there is going to be a good one, I say, please, even if I'm an old lady, will you invite me yeah. to your book launch? You know? Yeah. Say, yes, they will. And I think that's a lovely thing for us. I think people as well sort of, um, I, I mean, I'm sure you have it as well. Like as a writer, when you do get to that stage, I think we all still have that childlike thing of, I still go into a bookshop and look at my books on a bookshelf. Yeah. And I never get bored of seeing, yeah. you know, that that thing that you wanted and dreamt about doing when you were young, you get to do oh, it I, and it's I, there I, and yeah, it's real. I always real. dreamt of having one book on one shelf. Yeah. And also, I, I always dreamt of one book being on a child's bookshelf. Yeah. And I always love, because um, I always say, um, and somebody comes up to me and they have they, about 10 of my books to sign or something like that, and I'm signing them all. And I said, God, I must take up. And they said, yeah, I have, I have bookshelves in my bedroom. And I have a whole section for your books. Well, you have a section for your books, all the boys especially. So, and I think that to have actually, in this bedrooms around Ireland and bedrooms in different countries, to have a shelf, yeah. a child in their bedroom, where they don't have much space, most of them, 
with a few of your books there, it's really special yeah. because you've become part of their life. And then if you're in a family, then it's the great thing about books is that, you know, a brother or sister will pass it on to the next one. So there's a longevity to it, which yeah. isn't in other forms of writing. Even with my adult books, it's not the same. But children have this special facility and to love books and care for books. And, you know, even when we're moving or selling houses, it's usually the children's books, our favourite children's books we take with us. Yeah. It's not the adult books, you know, that were the best sellers or the in book for a book club to read. Yeah. It's usually the ones we loved, our Heidi or <laughs> Secret Garden or things like that we take with us, you know. Yeah. So when you're writing a story then, how, how, how do you know when a book is a book? I mean, when you've, when you've written your books over the years, how have you found those characters? How have you found those stories that you said, this is what I want to write about? And especially, I suppose, you know, when you're writing about something like The Famine, which is a, was a particularly challenging and difficult yeah. subject for writing for, for children, how do you know this is the story I want to tell you, this is the way, and these are the characters that I want I to... See, I never imagined to actually under the Hawthorne tree as a, as a book that was ever going to be sold to anybody. Hmm. It was just written to my own children. And um, I immediately, I heard the story of three skeletons buried under a hawthorn tree and the hawthorn tree was being cut down. We have men cutting down trees in our own back garden at the moment. But anyway, so I remember, and the poor man when he cut down the trees and was taking out the root of the, the big root of the hawthorn tree, saw um, a skull and bit of bone and um, re recognised it as human bones. And in fact, when they dug them up, there were three skeletons and there was utter pandemonium in the little school down the country where they were taking out the hawthorn tree out of the field. and. Uh, the, remember the teacher saying on the radio, oh, the children were, who were these children? What happened to them? When did they die? And the bones had to be all bone density aging. The forensic people had to come down and go through them. And they found out they were from the time of the famine. And I remember at home, I felt like a lightning had gone through me and I just couldn't put these three little children buried that nobody knew their name or how they died or what happened and in, under a hawthorn tree where the children were playing and, you know, playing football and girls were making daisy chains and every break the children were out playing in this field around this hawthorn tree. And I kept saying, this is incredible. And they were so shallowly buried. There wasn't a grave, it was just shallowly buried. And um, I just couldn't put it out of my mind. And then I immediately saw the children that night. I went to bed, I dreamt about them, but they were stand, they weren't lying down dead. They were standing up. Now they were very, very scrawny and skinny because they hadn't eaten and they were they were, but they were very much alive. And I remember just like, like a ghost finger saying to me, you, we want you to write our story. And I was saying, why the hell would it be me, you know? But, um, and their names immediately came Eileen, Michael and Peggy. And then had little sister Bridget, who, because I knew one child had to be buried under a hawthorn tree. Mm. So I did that, but it was a hard book to write, but it came, I wrote it in 12 weeks. I couldn't put it down. And my little boy was a baby and still doing night feeds and everything. And um, I just couldn't let the story down because I just knew it was a really important story for me to tell. I wanted to write it for my daughter and for my, my young children. And then it was only when I had it written that um, one or two people read it. Um, my lecturer in UCD read it and other, other one or two other friends read it and they said it has to be made into a book. I didn't even think of it as a book. Yeah. I was the story I want because I was writing all kinds of stories at the time and writing for newspapers and magazines and everything. And it was just a story I wrote. and. Um, and I said, God, do you think it would? And I said, God, it's terribly sad though. Would anybody want to buy that book? And they said, no, you should send it. So then actually then I sent it to, um, I just thought nobody outside Ireland would want to understand the famine. So I said, mm. I'll send it to an Irish publisher. So I went to a Brian, Brian Press. And of course then, much to my amazement, they took it. But but they had so they sold the world rights, like literally, be, be, actually a lot of the world rights were gone before the book ever came out in Ireland. Right. So it was just incredible, but it's a really special book. But I, what happens to me, I get the character in my head first and what's happening with them. And then I begin to see where the hell are you? And then I realize what the story is. And the story then gets bigger and bigger and bigger. But I, I always have to start off with the character because I feel if you don't have a good character, I don't know if you're the same, it's very hard to have a good book. Oh yeah. It's char characters are what, I mean, anybody who, you know, when you no. read a book, it's the characters, isn't it? That, that, yeah. that, are, that are always the heart of any yeah. story. Yeah. And you can have as much action and drama or emotion yeah. or whatever you can throw at it. Yeah. But if there's no connection with the character or characters in the first place. Yeah, it doesn't really it doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. So I always have to start off with the character. And sometimes, I mean, mostly I get the character very easy. And sometimes when I get the character, I don't get the right name. Hmm. I find names really hard. Maybe if I'm getting older, it's hard because I've used some of the names, I don't know. <laughs> but I find like I might start writing and I'll have the character called some name. And then about 
about you know 10 12 pages in i said i actually don't really like that name yeah. it doesn't suit them and the character saying to me this is not me this is not my name you know so then i have to go and change the name and once i change the name I have, my, I have my book. Because yeah. It's a simple, simple thing. <laughs> the character saying, you're not thinking about me properly because you're not thinking about me properly. You know lots of things about me, but you just haven't got my name right. And mm. please get my name right. It's really important to me, the character <laughs> says to me. So I have to do that. And then when I get that right, then it works. But um, I must say, every book I've done um, has been character driven. The character comes first and then the story builds up. I, I might have a rough idea, like I hear like bombs in the background. I said, where the hell are you, Sophie? I'm in World War II. I, <laughs> London, the Blitz, London's being bombed, you know? And I say, where are you, you know? And uh, so... Uh, but it's so, so exciting when you find a new character and a new story and you be able to like build, get the blocks to build it and make it. Yeah. You're the same shame with all your wonderful characters. Yeah, but I suppose mine are often a little bit... Well, mine are quite different. I mean, you know, my most recent books are about a robot. Yeah, but, still, he's, <laughs> so, but he's still a great character, but, though. Yeah, but I think, I, I think the thing is you're trying to find... And I think what I... I you know, I suppose the challenge for, for, for you is different to my challenge, but I suppose there's a certain link in that you're creating characters maybe across time or across a f fantastical world, but they still have to connect. Oh, yeah. So, um, you know, the, the challenges that a child is facing in World War II or the, the, the you know, or the, the, the challenges a traveller child are facing yeah. or the challenges that children in the famine are facing, you know, I presume for you, you know, th that connection that you make with a, with a reader um, is, so, is so important and... Like, do you ever, do you ever, you know, do you, I, I don't know if I'm going to, uh, if it's quite the right way to put it, but with modern readers now yeah. um, and with kids now, has there ever been ever that worry that, oh, you have to write a certain type of character or a certain type of story because this is what they want? Or no. do, do you find that when no. you find the right character, whatever the setting that they're in, that the, that the reader will respond to it regardless of... of well, I, well, I don't know. I hope so. I, I, I actually, I, I'm not... A, trendy writer i'm not writing those kind of books i'm writing a story a story i want to tell with the characters i've created and like i get involved in the book i go into the world and usually it's a world i don't know much about and they, they bring me into it and i find out about it um so but the character really if, if the character isn't right for me it jars and sometimes i read books and the characters are weak quite mm. weak yeah and they're not strong enough to carry the book it's a big idea but they're not strong enough and i think um, sometimes people especially kids as they're writing they need to really think about their character yeah. You might have an amazing, fantastic book you want to write, but you have to get a good character to put in it. Yeah. If your character's weak, it's very hard for a weak character to, car to carry a good book. And, yeah. and everybody, all of us who write, whether we're in school or we're in college or we're older, we all want to write a good story and a good book and the best one we can. And um, people get, oh my God, I've got all these great ideas, you know. But the first one, who... Who is going to carry your idea for you? Because give time to that, that it, so it'll work. You know, if you don't give time to that, you can have wonderful things all over the place, but your character won't carry it. You know, so it's it's a really important thing. This is it's your starting point. Yeah. So you have been writing, and you were saying you were writing during lockdown, and yeah. you have a new story, children's, new children's book. Yeah. yeah. Well, hopefully, children's book. I, it hopefully, might come out. I don't know. I probably maybe not this end of this year or early next year. I don't know. But um, I, when I was growing up, I loved, I loved poetry. Yeah. I said about Seamus Heaney, but I loved Yeats's poetry. And um, I remember there was a very famous poem called The Stolen Child, about the fairies taking this child and um, taking him away um, from pain and sadness and, and the human world. And I remember I used to read that over and over again. And I love lots of Yeats's poetry, but I always had an idea um, about changelings and stolen children. Mm. And uh, I remember then just... This, just in the lockdown, I said, I'm going to try and write something else before I go into another big book and maybe an adult book or another big kind of book. I said, I'll have a bash at this. And I'd be so long wanting to do it. And I started writing it. And it was just such a joy to write about this girl, Anna. And um, her mum and dad have, are divorced for years. And her mum gets remarried in London. And they're, they live in London. And um, her mum goes off on this fancy honeymoon to South America with her new, with her new dad, her new stepdad. And her dad comes and sees her regularly. And she sees her dad. She has a great relationship with her dad. But um, then her mum says, I know the ideal thing. You can go and stay with your dad for five weeks. And her dad lives in Ireland in Saigo. 
and she has a little half brother Jack. So she comes back to Ireland and she really doesn't. She's really annoyed with her mum because, first of all, why the hell can't she be going to Brazil and Argentina and Venezuela and all these places that her mum is going? But it is her mum's honeymoon. In fairness, you know second honeymoon and uh, so uh, she's dumped on her dad and she gets to this this house fairy hill she'd seen it when she was a little girl when she was much younger when her mum and dad were still together and of course there's no proper tv there's no computer games there's nothing nothing it's remote and um, and she has a little half brother jack and um, so she finds it really hard to settle and be happy and then over the space of the few weeks, things really begin to change for her and she begins to realise it's a different kind of life than she has in London, which is kind of busy. They live in the centre of London. And, uh, but also, she keeps finding out things about the house and um, why it was called Fairy Hill and uh, things that happened back in their family. And uh, she gets to know this little half-brother and she really doesn't really care that much about him because she's only seen him since he was a baby hardly and you know and she's stuck minding him and you know if you suddenly if some a girl comes along and she's kind of 13 and lands in the family you're going to be used to mind your little brother so she has to keep minding him and then these weird things keep happening he's a kid who just seems to disappear and would walk off with a stranger and he walks off with lots of strangers and then she begins to realize this is really bizarre and um uh Actually, she begins to suspect someone's trying to kidnap him. And she said, why would they kidnap him? They've no, the family are not that wealthy. They don't have anything of value. And um, she begins to realize it's connected to the fairies. And what happens with the fairies is she begins to realize they can shape shift and change. And uh, um, so she doesn't realize that at first, but then she begins to realize that her brother is in absolute danger. And uh, she meets this boy down by the lake, Daniel. And he's always on his own down there. And he's always, he shows her the birds and he shows her the woods and the forest. And he's really very unusual and very different boy. He's not like any other boy she ever met or ever knew before. And uh, Daniel, um, she begins to realize something really strange about him. And the next thing, her brother goes missing. And oh, first of all, oh, the fairies come into the house. Oh, they do terrible things in the house. I don't want to give the book away, but uh, her brother goes missing anyway. And um, she's you know they're all the police are out hunting from everything it's terrible they're really worried and he comes back but she meets daniel and she hasn't seen him for a few days and she tells him that her brother had gone missing and um he said uh, she said oh thank god jack is back and he said what's jack like and jack is very quiet and he comes back he's very different and he said he's not your brother and she said, what do you mean he's not my brother and he said he's a changeling and she said what's a changeling and he said what you don't want in your house and uh, so uh it's a kind of a very big story. And then she has to go and get her real brother back. And nobody, she's been trying to tell her dad and her, you know, her, her dad's partner about strange things happening. And they keep thinking she's imagining and that she's looking for attention. And she's, you know, just being, you know, feisty, being heisty because she's sent to live with them rather than being off with her mum. So it's kind of a mixture of different stories. But I really had fun writing it. Um, I really had fun, you know, using the fairy things you know from Yeats yeah. and uh, actually some of I went, w went back to a lot of his poetry and got images he imagery he used to break, build into the story and she goes to get him back and um, oh it's a really big adventure and she goes to get him back and she's attacked by every god's creature on earth but anyway so um it's a different book and uh, I'm happy to have done it and, you, and I believe you're very happy to read some of it for I'll us today as well. I'll read just a tiny, tiny bit. I'll talk a, a little bit about shape shifting and, and things that happened with her. But it was a book I didn't think I'd ever write. And it's been in my head for a long, long time. And that's a really good thing, I think, having the lockdown. I've been able to do that and take time out to do it and let my imagination run and work. And um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a simple book, simple to read, but yet quite complex ideas and, um, and to get the hang of it. But I hope um, readers will like it. I really enjoyed writing it and um, I really liked the setting of the book because she's been always on her own with her mum in London and she sees her dad. But when she comes back to Ireland, she realises she's cousins and she learns how to ride and she learns how to, her dad brings her surfing. And she's in a whole, whole new world that she's never experienced before. And um, I think um, it's very different for her. And but then it's different, but also it's really weird. The magic part of it is really weird. So that, that's something out of her realm altogether that she's never experienced in London having anything like this happen to her before. So it's different. <laughs> Great. Well, you're going to read from some of it now. Yeah. Just going to read a little bit of a chapter from Fairy Hill, my new book. Um, as Anna is uh, living in the countryside, has come back from London, living with her, her dad and his partner, 
uh, stuck in the middle of nowhere where she doesn't want to be and stuck with her little half-brother, Jack, who's always disappearing. Um, Maggie had sent her to the shop to get some fresh bread. Walking with Jack was so slow as he kept stopping to look at things. Jack, if you walk a bit faster, I'll buy you an ice cream, she cajoled. Though she had no idea if the shop even kept ice cream, but the promise at least got him to hasten his pace. There was nothing of interest in the tiny village, just a grocery shop, a pub, a church, and a small school that had closed down a few years ago. The sun was hot and they were both tired by the time they reached the shop. Three bicycles were propped outside it, the young riders inside standing at the counter. Ice cream reminded Jack, making a beeline for the ice cream cabinet and pointing at an expensive covered cone with nuts. I'm not buying you that. What about this froggy one, she could hold she began to, as he began to get stroppy. Or this orange rainbow one, or the chocolate and vanilla penguin one. Penguin one, he pronounced, as she grabbed it, the cone for herself before getting a large carton of milk and a loaf of bread. As the boys ahead of them counted out the money, she let Jack have his ice cream. He'd already had a few licks of his chocolate-coated vanilla ice as she paid. Packing things in the shopping bag, she realised he was not near her, and grabbing the chain, she went outside. Where the boys were chatting in the sun. Have you seen the little boy that was with me, she asked them. Nah. Maybe he's still in the shop. No, he's not there. He's with your friend, said the boy in the football shirt as he sat on his bike. That other girl. What other girl? The one that was with you. She stayed out near the door talking to him, said the other boy. They went up that way. Anna walked quickly. What girl were the boys talking about? She hadn't seen anyone. She was in big trouble if Jack wandered off again. How far could he possibly get? It only took her a minute to catch up with him. Jack was engrossed eating his ice cream, a girl about her age walking beside him. Hey, wait for me, she yelled. Jack turned round puzzled. The girl stopped too and Anna froze. It was bizarre, scary, the weirdest thing ever. The girl looked just like her, identical. She even had the same blue and white striped shirt on. They could be twins, identical twins. She didn't know what to think. Jack. He looked at her and back at the girl. Even at some distance, Anna could see the bewilderment in a small face, unsure of what to do. Jack, it's me, Anna. Don't move, she bothed, as the other girl began walking with him off the road towards the trees. Suddenly, Jack's ice cream tumbled on the ground and upset, he bent down trying to save it. Anna was beside him in an instant. Thanks for catching him for me, she said, trying to be friendly. The girl said nothing, her face a paler image of hers, which seemed to suddenly shimmer in the sunshine, her eyes cool and distant as Anna stood face to face with her. Who are you? Anna asked shakily as she lifted Jack in her arms. Are we related? The girl said nothing, not a word. It's all right, Jack, she soothed, for he was hot and sticky and upset, clinging to her like a little monkey. She turned to the girl to ask why had she gone off with her brother instead of waiting for her. The girl stared at her. Anna was scared. It was like looking in the mirror. But the girl seemed to fade before her eyes and in a blink just vanished. Anna st was stunned. What had just happened? Wondering where her lookalike had gone to. The resemblance was eerie. No wonder Jack had gone with her. They could be twin sisters. She was tempted to try and follow the girl, but she could see Jack was tired. Come on, let's get you home, she coaxed, letting him have her own ice cream as she tried to shake off the strange, strange feeling of having met her double. Later on, she asked, Dad, do we have cousins or relatives living around here who have a daughter, a girl about my age? Anna asked her dad over dinner. No, there's just Liam and Ted and their families, replied, and Jenny's the nearest to your age. Why? It's just, I saw a girl today who looks really, really like me. She's almost identical to me. We might have a few distant cousins, I promise, but there is no one your age who looks anything like you, he laughed. Anna stared at her plate. Instead of being reassured, she felt suddenly fearful of the strange girl and whatever she was up to. You have to read the rest of the book to find out what happens. <laughs> and now from glamorous and Leary all the way to just as glamorous, maybe even slightly more glamorous, sometimes, Wicklow, and to Paul Howard, who has written this wonderful, and if you, if you like a book that not only has adventure and jokes and strange characters and a proper villain um, and a great hero, but also a book that I think has more smells in it than <laughs> any other book that's been written for a long, 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 long time. 
and uh, you love Aldrin Adams and the Cheese Nightmares. And Paul Howard is here to tell us all about it. Paul, how are you? Hi, Shane. I'm great, Shane. Yeah, yeah, really good. Thanks. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned the smells because everybody who reads the book has read the book so far has mentioned that it's made them incredibly hungry for cheese yeah. that it's given them craving which is kind of my intention all along um i would have loved to have made it a scratch and sniff book um yeah. it's a terrible shame that there aren't scratch and sniff books in, in the world anymore but when i was a kid they were all the rage you know and uh and, and they kept their smell for ages. But then I suppose one that smelled of that many cheeses, there's probably 200 different cheeses mentioned in it, would absolutely stink the house out. You, would, you couldn't live in your home if you had a book like that under the roof. Well, I had, I had a pizza yesterday and I was waiting for my four cheeses pizza, which I was, so I'd clearly been influenced by the book. <laughs> and as I was sitting there, somebody else at one of the tables nearby was getting four cheeses pizzas. And my kids all at the same time and my wife all went, what is that terrible smell? What is it? And I was like, well, that's that's people having the dinner that I'm about to have in front of you now. So um, <laughs> they are particular. Like, what is it about cheese? And what is it? I know you're going to tell us a little bit about the story behind the book, but um, you know, what is it about cheese that you decided to kind of put at the center of of this story? But cheese is my favorite food um, by by a considerable distance as well. Um, uh, but for as long as I can remember, I've had a difficult relationship with it. You know, on the one hand, I'm completely and utterly addicted to the stuff. Can't pass the cheese counter in the supermarket without stopping to pick something up. Um, favorite cheese in the world, favorite food in the world. But on the other hand, eating it after dinner uh, late at night always causes me to have strange dreams and often nightmares. Um, so that was kind of the fascination with it, really. Um, the, the sort of property of cheese to sort of give people nightmares. Um, it's, it's often dismissed as an old wives tale, but I can tell you it's, it's, uh, it's definitely true because it happens for me. Um, Mary, my wife, she gets cheese nightmares as well. And um, it was uh, a few years ago in the middle of the night. We'd often wake up in the middle of the night and kind of after eating cheese and exchange our, our, our nightmare stories with each other and it was out of that that the um that the idea uh, arose for a, a, a sort of superhero character a child superhero who can eat cheese before he goes to bed think really really hard about somebody maybe one of his friends and access their dream state and help them with their anxieties and fears that manifest as nightmares Great. So, so, yeah. So when, um, when did you start writing the book and when did you, you know, how does a book go from being this idea that you have in the middle of the night and this vaping to this story and this particular hero um, and, uh, you know, and the villains and everything uh, put together? When, you know, when did you start writing it and plotting it out? I, I, I probably, it probably, it germinated in my head for probably three or four years before I did anything with it. And sometimes that's that's the best way, you know, I have some ideas sometimes and I sit down and hammer away at the keyboard and then, you know, three months later it's done. But this was one of those ones that I felt really needed to sort of cook along in my head. And um, I uh, so so, yeah, I, 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 I let it I let it cook for three or four years. And then um, I, I did a first draft of it about, th about two years ago, uh, three years ago, wasn't terribly happy with it um but i kind of i i kind of established the principle that's sort of the, the the main plot device if you like that this kid he hears somebody's in trouble he hears they're having bad nightmares he eats the cheese goes into the dream um but it, it the first draft i wrote it didn't feel like the origin story which this is um it felt like i was missing the origin story which was his discovery of the power and um wondering what it is a weird superpower to have actually to be able to access somebody's dreams and to actually appear when somebody's dreaming that they're drowning in the sea to appear in a rowing boat and to be able to help them um it's a very unusual superpower it doesn't come with a cape it doesn't come with an instruction manual telling you telling you what it's for or how you should use it so all of these things are things he has to discover as he goes along so i sat down uh, last april it was just after the the start of the first lockdown and I had all this time on my hands 
and that's when I started to kind of you know envision the story as something bigger you know and um I, there's an enemy his enemy his nemesis in it is called Habeas Grusselvart mm -hmm. And he didn't appear in the first draft. And that was one of the other things that was missing at the beginning. It was, it was, you know, he's a superhero. Every superhero needs a supervillain. Um, and uh, so then he, once I once I created Habeas Grusselvart, then uh, I kind of had a, a, a compass really for his world and for his mission. And and tell us about Aldrin, because Aldrin is he's not a kind of a normal superhero you know he, yeah. he's a kid who who maybe doesn't feel like super being a superhero is necessarily the kind of thing that should be for him yeah he's i mean he's a, he's a, he's a slightly overweight kid um he you know i i like the idea of of you know of writing about heroes who don't look like classical heroes you know that he's not square jawed he doesn't have doesn't have a six pack or anything like you know and he's part of a group at school who are called the oddballs and I identify that with that because I was I was one of the oddballs at school myself, you know. I think a lot of writers were. Um, and he's in this he's in this sort of close little group, and they've just started in a new school, and he's struggling with um, you know uh, things that have happened in his life, like his 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 mother has died um, a year earlier, um, and his father runs this cheese shop called Say Cheese, uh, which is a pawn on Say Cheese. Um, and he, he the, you know, the pe people aren't eating as much cheese as they used to, uh, and the shop is under, in, you know, it, it's it's uh, it's about to close down. He's got a lot of financial problems. His dad, and um, and then in the midst of this, Aldrin just accidentally eats cheese one night before he goes to bed. Thinks about his friend, and the next day in school, his friend says to him, "You were in my nightmare last night." And then he describes the exact same nightmare he remembers. So this sets him thinking, was I actually in his nightmare or is it just a, you know, 1000 billion trillion to one coincidence? So did you want to read? You actually were going to read a couple of, yes. uh, or a little bit from, from yeah. the book. I'd be delighted to. Okay, this is chapter one, start at the beginning. Cheese for every meal. Most people have a happy place a favorite spot that fills them with warm, fuzzy feelings of joy. For Aldrin Adams, it was his mum and dad's cheesemonger shop. It was called Say Cheese, and everyone agreed that it was the best cheesemongers for miles and miles around. To Aldrin, though, it was far more than just a shop. He found comfort and delight in the smells and colors and the shapes of the hundreds of different varieties of cheese that Cynthia and Doug Adams laid out with loving care each day. There were white cheeses, orange cheeses and yellow cheeses. There were brown cheeses, blue cheeses and even green cheeses. There were cheeses covered with brilliantly colored wax, fire engine red, dark chocolate brown and bright tangerine. There were cheeses filled with holes, cheeses dusted with charcoal, and cheeses marbled with mold. There were wheels of cheese the size of car tires, some stacked flat on top of each other, others standing on their sides like books in a library. Some were cut in halves or quarters. There were cheeses shaped like barrels and cheeses shaped like pyramids. There were cheeses shaped like footballs and rectangular slabs of cheese that looked like tombstones. There were cheeses that smelled of fresh cut grass and cheeses that smelled of, revolting as it sounds, sick. There were cheeses that smelled of equally disgusting, sweaty feet and cheeses that smelled of butterscotch ice cream. There were cheeses that crumbled when you cut them and cheeses that oozed. To Aldrin, it was just a magical place. I actually about halfway through there realized my mouth was watering. <laughs> uh, it's like, it is even even when you go to the bit where they smells like sick. Yeah. And that's the thing about when you're writing for kids, they love that stuff, don't they? They just love yeah. uh, they love the stuff that's kind of more disgusting. That's what they want. Yeah. To, I mean, I really want. I mean, I, I know from my own point of view, um, you know the the books I loved as kids had that element as a kid that they, they had that element in them. You know, um, my favorite book when I was a child was Fungus the Bogeyman by Raymond Ooh, yeah. Briggs, and I think it was my favorite book because it was banned in our house. My mother, my mother looked at it one day. I took it out of the library and my mother looked over my shoulder and saw what it was about. And that was it. And, you know, for anyone who hasn't 
who hasn't read it before. I mean, you know, he, he, this is a family of bogeymen who live um, and essentially it's kind of like a, a kind of working class existence, kind of very much like my life at the time, you know, um, and they're, they kind of live in caverns under our, underneath our feet in these kind of red brick Victorian houses. And they do disgusting things like they rub dirt into their armpits and they rub grime into their teeth. And um, there's lots of scatological references about, you know, snot and uh, uh, poo and all sorts of stuff like that. But those were the things I loved as a kid. You know, it was it was that sense of being able to, you know, smell the book. And even if even if it smelled disgusting in your mind, uh, I love that. I tell you, there's there's no better way to get a, a child reading than to tell them they can't read something. There's no no better way than to get them fascinated about something than to say, you can't look at that. Yeah. You can't look at that. It's exactly, sometimes it's kind of maybe it's the easiest way to get kids to read. I remember Adrian Mole was the thing when I was growing up that I was not allowed to look at, The Secret Diary yeah. of Adrian Mole, which, yeah. you know, is, is you know, is it is it a, it's not a kid's book but it was a book that it had the uh you know aged what 13 and three quarters on the front so i was i was i was told i had to wait until i was that age before i could read it yeah and it, in my mind it became the greatest thing that i would ever <laughs> possibly read because it becomes even better in your head when you can't yeah and um, yeah. what kind of kid were you then were you you were obviously a reader as a as a child where but you you're you're big into your sport were you yeah you, i mean was, i, I I liked I liked books. Um, I was an outdoor kid, though. You know, I, I love sport. Um, uh, you know, I, but I remember when I was about, I'd say about ten years of age, the first mobile library appeared in our in our community, and it par I, I, I grew up in Ballybrack, and it parked on um, Church Church was it Churchview Road, the yeah, Churchview Road in Ballybrack Village. And just pulled up there, this huge truck, and we used to have fun every Wednesday. About thirty or forty of us from the estate, we would go and rock, rock the mobile library. That was the fun, you know, just rock it back and forth. One day, the librarian came out and she said to us, she was laughing. She said, "That's that's great fun, but well, I tell you what's even more fun. What we have in here. Have you thought about coming inside?" We went in. And um, and it was amazing. Like it really was. I mean, we went. I went to the library when I was a young kid, um, but a lot of the books I suppose that I was reading as a as a child were very because I, I grew up first in England. They were kind of very Anglo centric books, you know. Like we read Just William and those kind of books. And um, uh, and but but that discovering the mobile library in Ballybrack Village was was it's just one of those moments, you know. It's kind of. Uh, it's, it's just one of those kind of discovering rock and roll moments almost, yeah. you know. There is something and, still, I mean, I, you know, I mean, I, for me as well, like the, the magic of a library, the magic of standing in front of a wall of books, a little, my library here in Scaries where I live is just, just up that way. It actually looks a little bit like your sort of backdrop there, the, the bookshelves, it's small and it's tiny and it just had all these books and all these discoveries and it felt like every time you sort of pulled something out you would just discover something new and magical and were you that kind of reader when you were younger that you would just yeah find you know find new things always looking for new adventures I'm still that I'm still that kind of reader now and I, I, I go to a lot more bookshops now than I do libraries but I will I, when I, I can't pass a bookshop it's an absolute curse but I'll, I'll come out with 12 books all on different topics like you know I'll come with some, a book on music and a book on sport and you know some fiction and so I sort of you know I, I, I pick from lots and lots of different trees and yeah I was like that as a kid as well like I read a lot of non-fiction I loved books about space I loved books about underwater exploration um I yeah, remember, is that yeah all that yeah yeah, yeah. I loved it and I read um Brian Glanville's History of the World Cup when I was very young, I think it was, I think it was the, the 1978 edition they had in our mobile library. So it's a long time ago. Um, and that was one of the reasons I wanted to be a sports journalist, you know, um, because, because I read that book and because he wrote so beautifully, you know, and um, we, there was a guy in our, in our community. I used to, I used to read a lot of the Ina Blyton books as well, you know, I just got a 10 or 11, but there was a guy in Ballybrack and he, he had this, uh, he, 
<laughs> he had this terrible habit. He, he would go into the library and he would tear the last page out of all the Enid Blyton books and all the mystery books. And that was his fun. That oh, was- Why am I like, laughing? That's terrible. And, 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 and I, I'll never forget how many times was, you know, a book, you, you'd spend hours and hours pouring over this book and just as it was getting to the, the resolution, missing page you know we all knew who did it like you know and i don't think there was an ina blight book in that library that had the back page contained in it that is terrible that is it is it is obviously kind of funny in its own way uh, for a bit of distance but it's also a terrible terrible thing um, oh. and uh, yes we shouldn't encourage people to do that at all but we could encourage them to enjoy the story of somebody else doing it and um and because I mean, you know, the books that you were reading, uh, that range of books, have clearly informed what you've done. Because you've 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 written a whole range in a, in a whole um, range of, of of stories, both fiction and nonfiction. How many books have you now written? Oof, I think I think it's about thirty. Wow. 30. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've written. I mean, twenty of them, twenty of them, Russell Calcetti books. Um, I did a, the story of Tara, the biography of Tara Brown. I did an autobiography of Roy Keane's dog. Um, I've done the Gordon's Game children's series yeah. with Gordon Darcy. Um, there you go. Have it here. Yeah. So um, we have a big fan in my house. Absolutely loves these oh, books. That's nice. Mad about rugby and mad about your, uh, the, the books as well. They're so much fun to write the Gordon Darcy books because to get a to get a co-author like Gordon, who who's happy to put all of the embarrassing things that happened to him in his in his rugby career out there for for people to enjoy, um, it's really refreshing, you know. And um, he's, there's a story in the last book about uh, a time he scored a try, what he thought was a try, how he had the ball and he dived over the line and jumped up and was kind of running around punching the air and realized he'd only crossed the 22 meter line <laughs> and gordon has like dozens of these stories true stories about you know mess ups things he did in his career that embarrass him and he's he, he wants them all in the books which is great great and um, so and that leads us unfortunately we don't have a huge amount of time left but it leads us kind of neatly to that question of what's next for you um in terms of children's books so uh what what your plans are whether it be you know another aldrin adam story whether it be another gordon game story or whether it be something else well you know what's like shane you, you tend to work a year ahead of publication so when a book comes out you're already working on the next one so i've just finished the third book with gordon um in the gordon's game series it's called lion's roar um and gordon goes off and plays for the lions against south africa um, and I'm just about to start work on the follow up to Aldrin Adams and the Cheese Nightmares, the second book. Um, and um, I plotted it out. I don't know. What, are you the same, Shane? Do you, do you plot everything beat by beat or do you? Um, I, the way I like to do it is to I like to know where I'm starting and where I'm finishing. Right. OK. And then I, I, I will often have a kind of a loose a, a plot going through it, but I give myself license to change all of that. So, yes. so yeah. I tend to, if, if I know where I'm going, and often when I'm talking to young writers who struggle to start a story, I'll often say to them, actually, if you can figure out where the end of the story is, mm. you can often, it, it's a bit like getting in a, you know, getting on your bike and if you know where you're going, mm. you can have a bit of an adventure along yes. the way. If you yeah, know yeah. where you're going to sometimes, yeah. If you're, if you know, if 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 you want to go somewhere, but you've no idea, or rather, when you you know, if you're if you're just kind of wandering blindly, you don't really have any plan, and it's much harder to do these things. So that's how I tend to work. I tend to yeah. know what's what coming. Are you quite a tight plot? Yeah, I am because pro probably because of my experience with the Russell Carroll Kelly books, I plot mm -hmm. them out beat by beat. So I know when I sit down. The the fifteen things that are going to happen in chapter one, chapter oh. two, chapter three, but. Uh, like you, I mean, I will deviate from the plot if something isn't working or if I think it's something better along the way, I'll throw it out. But I like to have that framework. So the next um, Aldrin Adams book, I have beaten it out uh, the, the entire thing. So I know exactly what's going to happen. Um, I have excellent editors in London who will tell me whether... <laughs> <laughs> whether they, these storylines stand up to scrutiny. And that's a great thing as well about, um, about you know, writing children's books. There's so much 
there's much more attention uh, to your story than there is with an with an adult novel like my Aldrin Adams was read by probably seven or eight readers in London in the in the Puffin office in London who gave me great feedback um because like I said it is my first solo venture into children's fiction so um you know there's times you know there's times I didn't I didn't know what I was doing frankly <laughs> <laughs> I think by the end I did, um, but it's. I think it's always good to tell you to remind yourself of that that you know you haven't done this before. So uh, make your mistakes in your in your early drafts and just make sure the last draft is perfect. Yeah. Well, look, well, I have to say I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I'm looking forward to sharing it now with the with the kids at home who I know are going to love it. And so best of luck. Thank you, uh, uh, no. Alden Adams and the Cheese Nightmares. And these wonderful drawings by uh, Lee uh, Cosgrove that are in it as well. And also with the uh, future Gordon's game, which we're looking forward to. Obviously, after the Lions have their victorious tour <laughs> of South Africa. When is that out, by the way? Is that out in October? Great. Yeah. Okay. So we'll all be, yeah, we'll all be we'll all be walking around uh, in our in our Lions gear. Uh, you know, yeah. Uh, after that and enjoying the story. So it's been brilliant to talk to you and best of luck with everything. Shane. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much to Shane and Marita for a fantastic conversation about books, about reading, and so much more. And thank you to Wonderfest and DLR Libraries for supporting this event for Crinoon and Oak. I do hope you've enjoyed it and go out there now and be creative.